Okay, uh, so today we'll be going over mechanical site prep. And so with mechanical site prep, um, it's going to be an establishment treatment. So we're still in the establishment treatment unit. And we're really talking about the economics and the ecology of mechanical site preparation today. Uh, we're not going to get into the societal aspects much because we've really already covered them. Because really with mechanical site prep, you're only going to be using this if you've already done a clear cut. Um, it's not used nearly as much with the other silvicultural systems. And so a lot of what we talk about with aesthetics and clear cutting is going to apply to mechanical site prep as well. And so with mechanical site prep, you're really focused, and this is going to be the take home message over and over again today, you're really focused on using it for intensive silviculture. So it rarely makes sense to try and do these treatments on stands with long rotations. It makes less sense to do these on stands that you're naturally regenerating. So this is usually focused on short rotation plantations where you're going to do mechanical site prep. Um, and the reason for that is that it is very expensive. So it tends to be one of our more expensive treatments. So what I want to start you with is an exercise to start thinking about how we might apply uh, different mechanical site prep treatments. And so what I want to do is show you a couple different stands. And both of these stands are from past years of field station that we visited. And so the stand on the left was a poorly drained clay site right by uh, a major highway. Uh, south of Jasper, and then the site on the right was a well-drained sandy site north of Jasper, and it was just out on a small woods road, miles from the gate, okay, so out in the middle of nowhere. And so what I want you to do, you have a landowner objective, and what they want you to do is plant trees that are going to produce hard mast. So you are going to have a plantation here, but that's more of a wildlife objective, so a little bit different. Uh, but here, your job is to get the trees in the ground. So what I want you to do is split up into small groups and in your small group, just come up with a short little prescription that ends with you getting trees in the ground. Um, and in that, you focus heavily on what you need to do from a mechanical site prep standpoint. Okay? So go ahead and split up and work on that. Okay, so as we look at these two sites, let's start with the similarities between them. So what's a treatment that you're gonna need on both of these? What's a treatment that you're gonna need on every plantation forest anywhere? Plant. You have to plant trees, right? So we know we're gonna to have to plant trees, but with this objective, you could come up with different spacings, you could come up with different species uh, that would meet this objective. So we don't need to worry about that too much today. Okay, um, and then as we look at these two sites, outside of mechanical site prep, what's another treatment you would probably apply to both? So herbicides, so typically we're gonna use chemical site prep um, in any of our plantations. And so a lot of what we're gonna focus on today, remember with our herbicides, and we'll get into them more uh, in a couple weeks here in class, with our herbicides, we really didn't start broadly using them in forestry until the 1970s. We started using mechanical site prep before that. So a lot of our history of mechanical site prep has been to give us competition control which nowadays we can do cheaper and more effectively with herbicides, but it's sort of taken us a while to move into that more operationally. So that's gonna influence a lot of what we talked about. Okay, so we're using that on both sites. So site two on the right, uh, we're, we're applying herbicides, we're planting our trees. What else do you need to do on site two there on the right? Okay, so disking breaks up shallow compaction. We'll go over that today. Uh, in that photo, you can probably get a pretty good sense of the soil texture. What soil texture does that look like? That's very sandy. So is it easy to compact a sand? Difficult to compact a sand. So do we likely have compaction issues out there? No. So do you want to disc it? Do you want to pay the money to disc it? Probably not. And, and again, we used to, that's an upland site. We used to disc a lot of our upland sites. And I'll show you some examples, but it was to give us competition control. But if you need one treatment for competition control, again, herbicides cheaper and more effective. So, so any other mechanical site prep treatments you'd recommend on the right there? No, no, if you're, if you're the one spending money on this stand, if you're the landowner here and you're out there with your forester, that's a good news site. That's a, well, look at this, we're ready to go, okay? That's an easy one, so you don't have to worry about much. So it's gonna be a cheap site to establish. Um, that, that site was up uh, sort of south of Dam B, 
um, up in Longleaf Ridge sort of country. So you could establish Longleaf there. That wouldn't meet their objective necessarily, um, but that probably what that would have been historically. But nowadays they're growing a lot of lot of pine plantations out there. Okay, so the stand on the left, we, we need to apply herbicides and we need to plant trees. What happens right now if you turn loose either a crew with a machine planter or a hand planting crew? They're not going to push through a lot of slash. They're going to walk off the job. <laughs> they will not be out there planting. You physically can't plant that, right? Okay. So what do you need to do there? The slash is already pretty well sp spread out. I mean, that's basically well spread slash that was like, seriously, like three feet tall. Just an enormous amount of slash. So what do you do with it? So burning would be one option. Okay. What's, what is a potential constraint with burning? It's on a big road, right? And so if you're on a, a major road, smoke is always something you want to think about. Um, now, what I haven't shown you well in this photograph, this was an old aesthetic management zone that they harvested. Temple Inland had left this as an AMZ. Um, and so this was a very long, very narrow stand right by the road. Um, so that would have made burning a lot more challenging. You definitely wouldn't have wanted to broadcast burn it because smoke would have been the problem maybe pile burning because we see TxDOT all the time is pile burning uh, right by highways and that's usually less of a concern. But the other thing I haven't shown you is there were power lines right there too. So that's another concern you've got with burning. You don't want to put a lot of heat and flame up in the power lines. Not a good idea. Um, so what else could you do out there? So that might be a site so extreme where you may look at chipping um, and the, the problem with chipping is you have to have some sort of market for it, okay? And with chipping, some of those markets are going to require what they call clean chips. And so clean chips are where you're out in the woods and usually you're chipping, you know, pulpwood size or larger trees and you're chipping the main stem. So if you go to chip a bunch of slash that's been down in the mud, those are not typically going to produce what you would call clean in woods chips where they're even debarking it and everything like that. So that may influence the market you can send it to. So uh, biomass energy plants that take chips, they want those clean in-woods chips. But you know, you may not have access to a contractor that can go in there and necessarily chip it. We're used to seeing urban forestry companies, right? Where they're clearing you know, a few trees out of someone's yard and they're feeding them into the chipper and they haul those off and you can use those for mulch or other things. But, but typically we don't see chipping done very much in the South for slash management. So what else could you do here? So a roller chopper, and we'll talk about roller chopping today. And what roller chopping is going to do is just break it up into smaller pieces and flatten it. That's really what it's going to do. So you're going to be able to plant that particular site if you roller chop it. This site had more slash on it than any site I've ever seen. And so many sites roller chopping could make it more plantable. I don't think it would work on that particular site just because of the really extreme amount of slash. So what was that? Yeah, so you could look at some sort of piling, whether that be wind rowing or some other type of piling, where you just move the slash into big piles so you can plant most of your area. Uh, we'll talk about wind rowing today. Wind rowing is not the best idea for some reasons, uh, but piling is sort of the same idea as wind rowing. And that's in fact what they were doing out on this site. So you get the slash out of the way by just pushing it with a giant dozer and piling it. Yeah, Kenny. Right, yeah, so either windrows or piles are often favorable from a wildlife standpoint. And so if you think back to when we did 2 age stands and uh, some of your groups had bobcats or rabbits, you know, piles would be a good thing for those particular species. So yeah, when you pile it, you don't have to burn the piles. So in this case, you're right, Kenny, with those objectives, it would make a lot of sense probably to keep the piles. Um, and with piles, even when timber's the objective, Sometimes what the companies will do now is they'll look at these piles and they'll get either drone footage or aerial imagery um, and they'll be able to get into their GIS and say, we've got a hundred acre stand and we have two acres of piles. And then what they'll be able to do is look at the costs of going out and burning those piles and compare those to the net present value of a whole rotation of timber managed on those two acres. And whichever one makes the most financial sense is what they'll do. So they may even leave the piles sometimes in a, a timber context. Here you might leave them because they're really big piles and you're concerned with smoke and the power lines being right there. Um, so lot, lots of different factors going in there. 
Okay, so we've got the slash piled. Is there anything else you'd suggest from a mechanical site prep standpoint on that stand? Bedding, right? Okay, so this is a poorly drained clay site. And so you're gonna need elevated microsites to establish your seedlings on or they're gonna drown basically. So you would need to bed it. And that's exactly what they did on that site. And I'll show you more pictures of this site later today. But again, so what you're seeing already with just some simple little site prep prescriptions is that it's expensive, okay? The prescription we just described on that photo on the left, just the slash management and bedding is gonna cost them 250 bucks an acre or more. So it's an expensive treatment done at the beginning of a rotation. So those costs may be carried for the entire rotation. And so for that reason, you're only seeing it done on short rotation plantations. And you're really trying to do anything you can to minimize uh, site prep treatments where possible. So if it's not gonna help with survival and growth, there's really not much reason to be looking at doing um, these mechanical site prep treatments. You wouldn't go out and use an expensive tool to fix something if it didn't need to be fixed, right? That's the idea. And so minimize the cost where you can. There may be different tax implications here depending on how you handle that site prep. Is it part of the previous rotation? Is it part of the next rotation? And so you all may get into that more in forest economics. Um, there's other things that you can do during a timber harvest that may influence what you later do in site prep. We'll talk more about that, how you can sort of tie the two together. And so minimize the cost where you can, do what you have to, but this is gonna be an expensive treatment. So here's what you're trying to do with mechanical site prep. We'll go over four objectives where you're gonna improve access, and that means slash management. So when we say access, we're talking about slash management. Um, you can improve survival and early growth, just like we talked about with bedding. We can reduce competition, but again, Herbicides are a much better tool in our arsenal for that. So use herbicides where you can, uh, not mechanical site preps. That's just sort of, if you, if you need to do a mechanical site prep treatment and it gets you a little competition control, great. But that's not the reason that you're doing it. And then we can fix problems where we've screwed stuff up in a harvest and we've rutted up a site or we've compacted a site. We can fix those issues uh, with mechanical site prep. That, that right there uh, is the combination plow that they were actually using on that first site that we just looked at. Uh, so that's a D9L high track dozer. And so if we have 50 students in a field station, you can pretty much the whole, fit the entire class in front of that piece of equipment. Um, it's absolutely enormous. So it was pushing up piles of slash that were probably one and a half times its height on that site. Some of the biggest slash piles I've seen. So there's like 30 foot tall slash piles. Yeah, that, that, a dozer that large is going to cause compaction, but if you look at that entire implement behind it, that's designed to reduce compaction. So it's causing some compaction as it moves through, but then the implement behind it is alleviating that compaction. And I'll show you data. It alleviates compaction very effectively. Okay, so with access, you need to know what you're going to be doing next. Okay, so that photo on the bottom left is a small wildland planter, a machine planter. And so that little dozer can only push through so much slash. There's other things you want to think about here. If you're going to be using that piece of equipment, I already talked about it this semester, where if you can leave a non-merchantable tree that was out there standing rather than fell it, then it's very easy for that wildland planter to move around a standing tree, much more difficult for it to move around a fallen tree that may be across its direction of travel, because you know you're gonna be spraying this site with herbicides and that's gonna kill that tree and it'll fall down a few years later, and not be a big deal on your site. So you may need a relatively clean, but not too clean a site for a wildland planter. It will have a blade on front of it. That's kind of an old school photo, modern wildland planters. The dozers are a little bit bigger than that. And so they'll be able to push some slash out of their way. Um, if you look at the hand planting image on the right there, they're using a hoedad there to plant on a steeper site. So you need to know how you're going to be planting this stand. So a hand planting crew can generally work their way through more slash than a machine planting crew, but are you going to get as good a job planting if you have more slash than less? No, they're not going to do a better job, okay? Um, if you were out working and planting trees all day, planting thousands of trees in a day, you're gonna do a worse job if you're working around a whole bunch of debris, you're gonna get your spacing off, 
There are going to be areas you just don't plant. You know, it's not going to be as good of a job. That goes with herbicide application. Most of our herbicide is applied with a helicopter in terms of aerial application. And so does slash matter if you're applying with a helicopter? Not really, okay? Um, you're gonna spray that just fine either way. Uh, what you see on the right, that might be more something you would do on a food plot scale where they just have a little ATV and they're spraying out the back of that in, in an old field. So, uh, but operationally what we see done is we'll see skitters applying herbicide. So say you have an area where you have a, you know, a neighbor that you know is very litigious or something like that. You may not want to do aerial application. You may want to do a skitter based application because there's less risk of drift herbicide moving off your property. And so if you're going to do that skitter based application, you, you know that you, you need less slash out there. The skitter's not going to be able to move through as much. So when are these operations going to be conducted? How are they going to be conducted? You need to know what's coming next. Now, in terms of linking the previous harvest to site prep, if you're the forester on the job for both, there may be some things in your control. There's certainly a lot of things out of your control, but there may be some things in your control. If you can improve harvest utilization at harvest, that makes your life easier later for site prep. It may be cheaper to pay a logger a little bit more to do something a little different with the harvest and then not have to do mechanical site prep after that. And again, think about the tax implications. That's gonna be one rotation versus another rotation, so they may be taxed differently. And so ideally you want high harvest utilization. You want more of the trees removed because that leaves less out there that you then have to worry about. And so here's a couple photos. On the left you see low utilization, so you don't have good access to that site. So that might be a site where you need to do what we call shearing, where you just run a dozer blade through there and push all that stuff down. It may be in your way. Now those trees are pretty small, many of them. You may be able to get a machine planter through there. Um, there may be enough leaf area out on those trees that you may be concerned if you're using glyphosate or triclopyr or one of our foliar active products for your herbicide treatment. You know, you may want a really high spray volume to get you know, all those different layers of vegetation. Whereas if you look at the high harvest utilization photo on the right there, they've got good access. They don't need to go do anything else. So there are some things out of your control that influence utilization. If it's in the middle of a wet winter and you've got a site that you can get harvested, you've got a 12 month site, pulpwood prices may be high. And if pulpwood prices are high, everything's going on the log truck, right? So they're gonna be taking as much as they can. Um, we often hear people complaining about pulpwood prices in our part of the world. So you'll hear forest landowners complaining all the time, you know, why am I doing all this stuff? Pulpwood's only $5 a ton. Um, and that, that's true. It, it may not be a high value product, but the mere fact that we have a pulpwood market at all is a major strength in our region. So if you go to other parts of the country, I've been out in Montana and they've been saying, we would love to thin this stand, but the nearest pulp mill is 150 miles away. So we can't thin it. And so we may have poor prices, but poor prices are a lot better than no market at all. So, um, and then the one thing that you may be able to control is the type of timber sale contract. So there's a couple common types of timber sales that you can look into, the pay as cut sale and the lump sum sale. So can any of you think of uh, something you may have done recently that might have been categorized as a lump sum sale? So a lot of you are in field station now and just did the bid sale crews. That's why I don't have envelopes in my office anymore. Um, but you know, those in field station in past years, you all did the bid sale crews as well. And so that was a lump sum sale where you went out there, you had, th this year was it trees that were painted or was it just certain trees on a tract? How was it set up? All the trees on the track, so that makes it easy. Some years you'll go out and it'll be a tract where all the saw timber is marked. So you're just doing a bid sale on the marked trees. But basically, if you know, you're know you the forester involved in this operation and you're a procurement forester for a mill um, and you purchase timber on a lump sum sale, are you gonna harvest every tree, get your logger to harvest every tree that you're legally allowed to? Yeah, you paid for those trees, you're taking them, okay? So utilization tends to go up on a lump sum sale, okay? Uh, there's other advantages to a lump sum sale. So when you do a lump sum sale, it involves a good timber cruise, like what you all hopefully did on the bid sale cruise. So you have a very good estimate of what's out there. And so you know what's out there, you do the lump sum sale, 
And if you're the, the landowner now, the logger has just paid you for all that standing timber. You've got all that standing timber that is now the loggers. It's not yours as the landowner to worry about anymore. Okay, those are no longer your trees as the landowner. Um, with the lump sum sale, some of the advantages there, they're now the loggers trees, which means if a log truck overturns and causes some damage out somewhere once it's off your property, those aren't your logs. And so you're not liable as the landowner. So there's some liability things that go into that that's interesting. And that's true for a pay as cut sale also. There's a rare type of timber sale that you really don't see used in the South, but occasionally in other regions, you'll see it done where uh, they'll little, literally sell logs roadside, um, but it's got some major disadvantages um, where those trees are already cut. So if no one buys them, you're out of luck. Those aren't trees growing anymore. Or if someone lowballs you, if that's your only offer, you kind of have to take it, you're stuck. You can't just wait another year or two. And then there may be different tax implications because you're selling a log instead of a live standing tree. So there may be different tax implications depending on what state you're in. Um, and, you know, lots of different things to think about there. Um, with a pay as cut sale, um, a lot of our companies will work this way where they work with loggers and they'll come up with some rate. Well, the, the, it will pay them so much per ton and often they link in per mile hauled. Okay, so they give them a rate there. Well, if you're a logger and you're out on a pay as cut sale, if there's a marginal tree where it's just really high effort to log it, or, you know, it's in an area that's difficult to access on the stand, you know, well, I'm not going to bother cutting that. I'm not going to get paid for it, but I'm not going to spend any effort doing it. I haven't already paid for that standing tree. So no big deal. So you tend to get less utilization. Um, in, in many cases, though, a lot of the loggers are probably going to want to go more with the pay as cut. Um, and so you may be in a situation where if you try to do a bid sale, a lump sum sale, you know, you may not get as many bids as you would hope. Um, around here, a lot of our consultants do use lump sum sales. A lot of the companies use pay as cut. Um, with pay as cut, if you're working with small private landowners, the, the thing you got to think about with pay as cut, you need a good accounting of what's coming off your stand. Uh, because it's not a lump sum sale where you did a good cruise and you know where everything, what you have. You may not have done a cruise, you hopefully did a cruise and still know what's out there. But as it's coming off, you need to know how many loads of saw timber are coming off, how many loads of pulpwood are coming off, what's on those trucks, um, or you could get shorted, right? And so you may have more potential for timber theft there where you see a few different types of timber theft. One is just go across the boundary and physically cut someone else's timber. One is, you know, a disreputable logger that goes out and, you know, someone's living in Houston or Dallas and they go hit their stand of trees here in Nagadoches County and they cut it, you know, just completely, no permission to do it. So that's real egregious. Um, but what you may see is more subtle, you know, applications of timber theft with pay as cut sales where you sneak a load off or something like that, where you have a contract, but, you know, they're sneaking a load off. And so it may not even be the logger doing it. Um, there's, there've been examples where the logger, you know, is reputable, ethical, they're doing a good job, but they're subcontracting out to the truckers. And one of the truckers comes out at night and loads up a load off the, the log deck and takes it to a mill without even telling the logger. And so it's really the trucker that's done it, but the logger may pay some penalties for that as well. Right? So, so pay is cut. You need mechanisms in there for good accounting. Um, what some of the companies will do is they'll hire third party companies. And so the company just gets a list of here's all the harvest we have going on this week. Um, they go out and they sneak into one or two of them and they put up cameras and stuff like that and they surveil them. And often these companies, they'll have some sort of either digital or physical ticketing system where each load has a ticket and that ticket goes to the mill. And so they link up the tickets at the mill, at the log deck. Um, and so then the company that's doing the surveilling can track all that and link up. This is what actually arrived at mills. This is what we saw coming off the tracks and do an accounting and make sure it's all above board. Uh, and so in that case, even the forester doesn't know that their site is being surveilled. That way the forester can't get in on it with the logger and steal the company's timber. So, so there, there's some nuances there between these different types of sale, but the lump sum sale may be better from a mechanical site prep standpoint. Then the other thing you can't control is what was there before. Uh, so our site that has the least amount of slash, of course, is if you plant an old field, right? Because an old field doesn't have, you're converting from pasture land, it just doesn't have trees out on it. So there's no slash there. 
Um, but if you harvest a modern pine plantation, there's not a heck of a lot of slash. Um, we've got good competition control, so it's mostly pines growing out there. And we've been breeding them so they grow straight with one main trunk that's not curvy and has small branches. So there's just not a lot to leave out there. Um, that stand in that photo on the bottom right, that's that same stand we wrote the prescription on. That was an old aesthetic management zone. So that was a hardwood stand with big trees. So think where we went for lab this week out at the ballpark, okay? Think when we were doing crown classification about that one big dominant water oak we looked at. Imagine how much slash is gonna come off just that one tree if you fell it. You're gonna be pulling some logs out, but that top of that crown, that was probably a quarter acre. It was spreading out over, it's gonna be huge. There's gonna be a lot of stuff left out there. So if you take a stand of big mature hardwoods, you may have a whole lot of slash. So not something you can control, but something you need to be aware of. And so with slash disposal, you know, this may not benefit growth, this may even be detrimental to growth. So the only time it's gonna be positive to growth is really just gonna be, you get better access, you get a better planting job, that better planting job is what gives you better survival and better growth. So it may indirectly impact growth and survival, but it's really just because it makes the planning job better. So minimize your cost with slash management. That's gonna be good from an ecological standpoint and an economic standpoint. So in terms of how we move slash around, how do we actually treat the slash? So we've already talked about standing trees where you can push them over with the dozer. We would call that shearing. Um, or you can just leave them standing, fly a helicopter over the top and spray them. And that seems to be what people are uh, more interested in doing nowadays. And then we've got these different ways to remove debris. And so I've got windrow on there, but I've got it crossed out and we'll go over that a little bit more. And so here's some examples of windrows. So windrows are where you just have the dozer and it pushes trees up into long piles. And so with windrows, we already talked about the wildlife benefits. So wildlife folks usually like windrows. There's some downside from a timber standpoint. So one, on an average stand, windrows may take up about 10% of your acreage. So your 100 acre stand is now a 90 acre stand. So there's a hidden cost there. You're losing productivity just because you're losing land. Beyond that though, let's imagine we get a plantation established in that photo on the right, and we come back after 15 or 20 years. What does that area where you didn't plant pine trees look like where that windrow was? What's there 15 or 20 years later? All the stuff you don't want. So that's where you find a lot of invasive species, privet, tallow, silk tree, china berry. So you find a lot of your invasive species there. You find a lot of your yopon, sweet gum, and some of our native hardwoods that you, know, you may not want in that stand. They, they're not meeting your objectives. And so that's a corridor for invasive species and weeds in addition to not just being a productive area. The other thing you've got to look at, you can see in that photo on the right, there's a fair bit of sand and soil pushed up into that windrow, okay? You do not want to be moving your top soil at all, okay? You want it right there because that's what's going to grow your next rotation. So you don't want to be moving soil around. So windrow is really not recommended anymore. Um, and I'll show you some more data in just a minute on why. But um, another thing that we, we tend to see with windrowing, where you do see it done, and I've talked to some of the foresters working for ACORN, we will see, still see non-industrial private forest landowners with windrowed tracts. But that's specifically because they're using a federal subsidy program through NRCS called EQUIP. And with EQUIP, you can get a lot of money from the federal government to help you establish a new stand and do mechanical site prep, which is expensive, but the downside to it is it comes with strings because you're using federal money. They want you to follow their specific prescription in order to qualify for that federal money. And because it's the federal government, I mean, the foresters, I've talked to them who work for NRCS, they know windrowing is not ideal and they're trying to get those prescriptions changed and they may have done so recently. Uh, but we've had a lot of stands where the prescription has been windrowing. And so you get equipped funding, you windrow it. And again, the big companies that are doing a lot of this mechanical site prep like ACORN, they're saying, you know, we're doing this. We know it's stupid. We wouldn't recommend doing this, but on these subsidy lands, you know, that, that's what you have to do to get the subsidy. So those are the only examples of stands around here nowadays where I've seen windrowing done. None of the companies are windrowing anymore. Uh, through raking in there just to show you, but raking is not really recommended either. So you've got those tines sticking down into the soil off that blade. So you're pulling up root systems. 
you know, that's the opposite of what you want to do from an erosion standpoint. So you may hear about raking, probably not the best treatment, not really a current thing that you see. And with either raking or windrowing, this is the potential downside. So in some cases, you may have windrowed stands that come out great, you know, it may work fine, but this is what could go wrong if it really does go wrong. So you've got a sensitive site, a site with low nutrient potential, and you've moved all the slash into those long windrows, or maybe you've got an operator where they just have the blade too low and they're pushing up too much soil into these windrows and they're moving all your top soil. And so what you see is the trees are real tall right beside the windrows because they've got access to the nutrients, but the trees in between are smaller and had more mortality. They're less dense, they're sparser. And so when you go to harvest this stand, this is, this is what you would see. So this was a 31 year old Bob Ollie stand in North Carolina. And the two cookies on the left, those are cross sections of the, the trees they harvested. And you can see the trees adjacent to the windrows are almost twice the size of the trees out in between the windrows. So you basically have 12 inch DBH saw timber. So you have decent sized saw timber right by the window. So you don't have a lot of it. And then in between you have six inch diameter pulpwood trees. Okay. Compare that to the cookie on the right. So that's from the adjacent stand that wasn't one road, but otherwise managed the same. And you've got pretty much the whole stand hitting about 10 inch diameter small saw timber. So where you make your most money when you're looking at harvesting and managing your rotation length and everything, right when you bump those trees up from maybe pulpwood size class to saw timber size class, it goes from five bucks a ton stumpage to 25 bucks a ton stumpage maybe for the landowner. So that's a big increase in value. You grow that saw timber a little bit bigger up into the 12 inch class, it's a little more weight, so it's worth a little more, but it's still at that same overall rate. You haven't bumped the rate up. And so you're probably gonna make a heck of a lot more money in this case with a, a stand that's very uniform. So logging costs are cheaper and a stand where almost everything is small saw timber, very little pulpwood out there by contrast. Um, so the lower uniformity, the, you know, a lot of those smaller pulpwood sized trees. And then the fact that on that windroad stand, I guarantee you that if you actually looked at them, it's gonna have a lower mean annual increment. Your overall tons per acre per year are less than on the stand that wasn't one road. So this is the sort of data uh, and the sort of scenarios that we've seen, and this is why wind rowing is no longer recommended, so. Okay, let's look at the ecological impacts some more of removing slash. So you have two graphs here, and this is nutrients removed in pounds per acre. And that panel on the left is showing you if we just harvest the stem. Panel on the right is a whole tree harvest, okay? So they're not leaving the tops out there, they're harvesting tree length. We commonly see that in first thins, taking out 40 foot tall trees for pulpwood, right? Where you get about the whole tree on the log truck. And so it's kind of interesting, the whole tree harvest doesn't remove that much more in terms of nutrients than the stem only harvest, which is you know, not what you might intuitively expect. It, it removes more, but not that much more. But then what you really notice here that you might not have guessed, those orangish red bars, the taller ones, that's sheer and pile. The short blue bars are harvest. You're removing more nutrients with site prep than you are with a clear cut. So probably not what we would expect. That's not intuitive. But as you start looking at it, if you take a log out and you look at all the boards in it and you take all the wood out, what's the nutrient concentration of that wood? It is what tissue is most of that wood? So it's going to be, is it flown? What's it going to be? It's the xylem. So most of what you're removing in a log is the xylem. You have a small amount of phloem, small amount of cambium, small amount of bark. Most of it is xylem. Is xylem alive or dead? Xylem's dead. Do dead, so it's dead. It's not even a cell anymore, right? So it's dead. Does it need a lot of nitrogen? No. No. Okay. If it's dead, it doesn't have proteins in it, right? And so it doesn't need a lot of nitrogen, nitrogen or other nutrients. So wood generally, it may have some more calcium, but generally it has a much lower nutrient concentration than the live needles, the live growing twigs, the fine roots, those tissues that are alive. Um, and so because of that, you tend to see the site prep treatment where you're actually moving around a lot of the foliage and the small twigs, you have much more potential there to move nutrients around than you do hauling off huge whole logs, because those are mostly just carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, which you know, you're know you not getting from the soil other than water uptake through the soil. But 
So kind of counterintuitive, but site prep, you have a lot more potential to mess up the nutrients on your site than you do even with a clear cut harvest. Uh, here's, I'll show you a few photos of some pretty old school equipment, but modern day that D9L high track dozer I showed you with the combination plow, that, that's the type of equipment that's doing most of our operations nowadays. But there's a smaller sort of old school dozer with a V blade on it. And it's got a KG blade there with the stinger where they would poke that stinger right through a standing tree, split it in half, make it easier to push over. Nowadays, we're seeing skidders that have eight huge tires on them and they can probably just knock trees over as they're rolling around pulling slap, you know, trees out of the stand. So equipment's getting larger and larger and larger. Okay, so somebody mentioned roller chopping earlier. Here's a roller chopper. So take that big drum, fill it with about eight tons of water and run rough shot over your site, okay? Breaks everything up into itty bitty pieces and then you can burn it and it looks real pretty, okay? That gonna increase growth on your site? Probably not, okay? Probably not. Um, and so we used to see a lot of roller chopping used back when mechanical site prep could help you with competition a little. That might help you a little, right? But honestly, if you roller chop a stand that's got hardwoods in it, what are the hard, how are the hardwoods gonna to respond to that roller chopper? They're gonna sprout like crazy, okay? This is just gonna anger them and not in the way you want hardwoods to be angry. Um, they're gonna come back through. So think about what this thing's gonna to do to Yopon. Boom, <laughs> it's gonna come back like crazy. So it doesn't really give you much competition control. All it really gives you is a pretty site, okay? And is a pretty site worth money? No. Not really, okay? Uh, so we used to do a lot of this in the 60s and 70s, and we've really moved heavily away from it. Companies now that may be site prepping 8,000 acres in a given year might have two or 300 acres they do roller chopping on, okay? So if we think about the type of site where roller chopping makes sense, as we look at this site, so say you don't burn it, say all you do is roller chop it, and you look at that site right there, okay? How's that site gonna work out? Say you get a big heavy rainfall, what's gonna happen? Your soil going anywhere? No, okay? So if you had a steep sandy site you were managing, would you wanna put a prescribed fire out on that site? No, because you burn up all the slash, you have the potential for gully erosion. Do you wanna run a big dozer on that site, shearing and piling? Probably not, gully erosion is a big concern. So what they're roller chopping now, they're only doing their sites that have high slash, are steep, and have highly erodible soils. And that's not a common combination in our area. And so pretty rare that they use roller chopping anymore. It's getting to the point where they're having trouble finding contractors that still have roller choppers um, that they can bring out there and do it. But, but you have a lot of folks that got really used to doing this in the 60s and 70s that may still be out there at the end of their career that love roller chopping. Um, and just want to roller chop everything because it looks real good. It's a very clean, pretty site. And they come up with all sorts of crazy stuff like the fins are cutting in these micro furrows and that's helping with infiltration and just all, all sorts of stuff just trying to promote roller chopping. But the, the data doesn't back it up anymore. Uh, that top site was chopped and burned. So nice clean site. I mean, if, if you are in a planting crew, I mean, you're probably hoping that everything's been roller chopped, right? Because that's as clean as a site can get. You can walk around there all day and plan everything very easily. So, um, With slash disposal, um, this is another thing you can think about linking it with the harvest, okay? So what we saw again a few years ago here in Nagadoshas County, we had the biomass energy plant come in. Um, and so people are thinking, you know, we can start chipping stuff up, we can start sending it to them. Um, and so some of the companies started figuring, let's make it easier on us to get stuff to chip. So they talk to their loggers and when the loggers are clear cutting, instead of taking the slash and grabbing it with the grapple on the skitter and dragging it back into the stand away from the deck, the loggers are mostly doing that just to get it away from the deck so it's not in their way. But from an ecological standpoint, it's good. It's spreading those nutrients back out. But operationally, why would you do that and then go out with mechanical site prep and pile it back up again? So you're paying one person in a big piece of equipment to drag it and spread it out. And then you're paying a second person and another big piece of equipment to put it all back together, right? Doesn't make sense. So what they did is they talked with the loggers and got them to start piling the slash, you know, near the deck, not right where it was gonna be in the way, but pretty close to the deck. And so then what happens is the loggers leave and lo and behold, your site has already been piled. 
and you can either, you know, chip the piles up and send them to the biomass energy plant. Well, that didn't work out because it didn't stay open for long enough taking chips. But now you can either burn them or just leave them. But in the harvest operation, your stand has already been piled. So, uh, and they're still doing a lot of that uh, with some of the companies around here now. Yeah. Is that chipping for biomass uh, The, the problem is, um, so the city of Austin put the power supply agreement out with them, um, and they did it in 2008, right before the economy dropped out. And that also coincided with just natural gas becoming very abundant and very cheap. And so it, it was basically, all the technology works, but their dollars per kilowatt they can sell, it's more than natural gas. So um, that, that's why we're seeing coal fade away too, right? It's just, it's a more expensive power supply. That's been overriding everything with the, coal's been declining since the 70s and it's just because it's more expensive than natural gas, wind, other options. So, um, so that, that's what killed them. It was the economics on it. So. Here's spot piling and again, a, a modern dozer would be larger, but if you need to pile a stand, that's an option. Piling, just piling like that might run you 100, 150 bucks an acre, so. So the advantages are a nice clean site that's easy to plant, uh, hopefully thus leading to better survival and growth. The downsides are it's expensive, it's time consuming, um, and if you screw up, you may harm your productivity on your site. You may move the nutrients around in a way you do not want to. Okay, so most of the rest of what we're gonna look at is gonna deal with soil tillage. And so the overriding theme here is Dirt is heavy, therefore it's expensive because you need a big dozer, okay? Don't tell Farish I said dirt is heavy, so. Um, but with soil, we can have lots of, you know, soils that aren't ideal to grow plants and we can manipulate them and we can make them more ideal to grow plants. So think about a typical soil where it's gonna be what, about 50% minerals, about 25% pore space, right? 25% water, sort of that idealized model of a soil. Um, and then, of course, I've left out, what, 5% or so organic matter. Um, and when you look at that, a compacted soil, it has less pore space in it, fewer pores to hold water and air. So not as ideal. We can fix that with tillage. So we can fix compaction. All right. If you have a lot of rutting, you may have very uneven terrain. And so, you know, you may have seedlings that are rooting out into the air. Growth goes down. So those are problems we've caused we can fix. Uh, but we can also take natural soils and, you know, soils that haven't been degraded and make them more conducive to growing trees. And so here's the five treatments we're going to look at. It's really only three treatments. Um, it's those top three treatments, bedding, disc harrowing, and ripping. Uh, you may never see disc harrowing called harrowing again. That's sort of an old school term, but I threw it in there so you'd be aware. Disking or plowing is what you commonly hear that one called. Ripping and subsoiling are synonymous. They're pretty much the same thing. And so you don't have to worry about them being different. And then combination plowing is just the combination of the top three things all put together. So this is really only three things we're looking at here. Um, you can see a bedded site right there. And so we've already talked about this. You're just trying to create a raised micro site. So now this little seedling won't drown because you put it up on a hummock. Um, with bedding, you can see a side benefit. You really just did it to get the seedling to survive, but look at how you threw up most of that A horizon and a lot of the organic matter right around your tree. And so it's taking it away from the weeds in between the trees and it's putting it right up by your tree. You may get an early growth and survival benefit as a result of this. And so there are sites where you wouldn't necessarily think they may need to be bedded, but then you cut your trees and you were walking around in this stand a few years before the clear cut in winter, it was dry, you know, your feet aren't getting wet. You cut the trees, those trees are giant pumps that are pumping your water table down. You cut them and now your water table comes up and now you're out there the winter after you've cooked that, like what the heck, it's all wet now. So, you know, you may need to sample out there a little bit more. You may not think you need bedding and then you clear cut and you realize, oh, we need to bed out here. Okay, as we look at that bed where that seedling is planted, what happens if those roots are, you know, what if there's like a big air pocket where the roots are hanging down into a big air pocket in your bed? What's that gonna do to your seedling? Yeah, so those roots will dry out and the seedling will probably die. So trees, tree roots, you know, plant roots of all times 
they're designed to grow in soil. They're not designed to grow out in the air. And so after you do bedding, you need to let the beds settle before you do another operation, before you do the planting. Um, and so you might have a six week rule where you let them go six weeks. A better rule of thumb might be a certain amount of rainfall. You need two to four inches of rainfall or maybe one or two heavy rain events on that stand and that rain will help settle that bed um, so that you can get it planted well. Soil texture may make a difference. You know, on a clayier soil, is infiltration gonna be sore on a clayier site or a sandier site? Clay site generally is gonna have lower infiltration than a sandy site. So do you need a bigger bed or a smaller bed? You need a bigger bed to keep your seedling above that standing water, right? So a clayier soil, a finer textured soil may require a larger bed than a coarser textured soil. Uh, do you want a machine plant a bedded site? You took all the effort to create this raised microsite and then you run a dozer on it and smush it down, right? So planting with a machine planter on a bed is not ideal. I'm not saying it's not done. It, it is done. <laughs> it is a smaller dozer that you're going to be machine planting with, but um, it does take some of the efficacy out of your bed. On the other hand, it's also compacting that bed down. So if your beds are too loose, if you haven't gotten enough rainfall on them, it may not be a bad thing. So. Okay, so we know we're gonna do this on our wetter soils. So if we take a look at that photo on the bottom, what's a good indicator there in that soil pit that tells us that's a wet site? Water. Yeah, if there's water in your soil pit, it's a pretty good indicator it's a wet site, right? So sometimes it's pretty straightforward. Uh, as we look at the soil profile above the water low, what's, what's the indicator telling you that may be a wetter site? Glaying. Glaying, it can't oxidize, right? So you get more gray and dull colors, not bright reds and yellows uh, that you would get from oxidized iron. So uh, modeling, of course, where you get glaying mixed in with colorful soils, that shows you you've got that fluctuating water table, right? So. So, you know, use your soil mapping tools, you know, use soil sampling in the field if needed and figure out which sites you need to bed on. You almost never see bedding on an upland site, but I will give you one example where that may be appropriate here when we get to the end of this lecture. So bedding, bedding works, it does what it's intended to do. It may give you a little competition control. We talked about how you got to time it right and everything. Uh, you're not gonna be able to bed a site if it's got a lot of slash on it. So that's a downside, you have to do slash management if you're gonna do a bed. And when you bed this site, if you had compacted soils, the bed isn't really fixing that. You still have that compacted layer beneath the bed. Um, so you may still have a problem there. Um, I've got a disc better up top, a drum better, roller better down below that. Those are pretty old school sort of equipment you really don't see used much anymore. That combination plow I already showed you, that's what does most of our bedding nowadays, so. Okay, so bedding raises your seedlings up above the water. Uh, but the other approach, of course, would be just to lower the water around your seedlings. So you dig a big ditch beside your plantation and then you plant your trees and lo and behold, you don't need to bed, right? We've had a lot of acres in the south where this has been done and they're very productive usually, grow very well. So is this something you'd want to recommend? You see a big drag line out there digging a ditch? No. Why not? It's moving a lot of soil may not be ideal ecologically, but there's an even bigger problem with it. Yeah, this is illegal. Uh, under the Clean Water Act, this is literally draining a wetland. And so this has been illegal since the early 70s, right? What was Clean Water Act 74 maybe? Um, so it is legal to maintain ditches that were established prior to the Clean Water Act at their original depths, but creating new ditches would literally be draining a wetland and it's illegal now. So. Um, if you end up prescribing this, just make sure you don't mention where you went to school. Um, so a lot of these stands, these wetlands, they would have had trees and other vegetation falling into the wetlands and not completely decomposing because they were underwater and oxygen was limited. So they built up these really thick layers of organic matter over hundreds and hundreds of years and you drain it and plant pine trees in it now and the growth is great. I mean, they're really growing the trees well. But the problem is you've exposed all that organic matter to oxygen now, so it's breaking down relatively quickly. And I mean, they'll literally drop over time. Um, but you know, if you have to drain a wetland, one, it's illegal, and two, that probably means it wasn't a pine site anyway. So you really shouldn't have been considering pine for that site. Okay, so next up is basically plowing, disking, disk harrowing. 
Uh, you'll see an example of a disker there being dragged by a dozer. Uh, there's different scales of equipment. So in agriculture, row crop agriculture, they, they are always very careful and have done a very good job getting stumps out of the areas where they're using this, right? So you look out in a cornfield, there are not a bunch of stumps. Uh, it would really mess up a lot of the precision equipment we use in modern agriculture. Uh, that's not the case in forestry. So you may need bigger, more robust equipment. Um, we had a study a few years ago we installed and we wanted to do some ripping, some subsoiling I'll talk about in a minute. And you know, there was a farmer nearby that the, the TPWD folks knew, had a tractor, had an ag ripping shank. And so we started using that and they broke it like three times because uh, you know just kept hitting, I think it was honey locust, small stumps and root systems out in this pasture. So, um, so you may need bigger equipment for a forestry application. And then, you know, looking at the scale of this equipment, if you get into mine lane reclamation, um, they can use some really big and expensive equipment. It's all being paid for with that coal seam they removed, right? Uh, but reclamation there, they may have D10 dozers, just massive do dozers with uh, Rome discs on them that may be, you know, discs like this, but they're tilling up two, three feet of soil. Uh, so they may be going much deeper. So um, really, we don't see a whole lot of disking done in our region. They used to do this a lot on uplands um, in further east, Carolinas, Georgia, those sort of areas. And again, it's the same story where we didn't have herbicides in the 60s, very common spread. They were doing this for competition control. So you don't see this used a whole heck of a lot anymore. Here's an example where they just to cut in a fire line. You could have done that just as easily with the dozer, right? So, uh, but the prescription would have been for well-drained upland clay or soils. So if we look at the impact of disking, so uh, the bulk density that trees want to grow in will vary by texture, but trees are real happy at bulk densities below one, uh, but 1 1.4 and above, those soils are pretty compacted. Trees don't like that. And if you think about why, think about how a tree roots through the soil, the tree roots expand in length using turgor pressure. So it's literally like blowing up a water balloon underground, okay? So if you have a compacted soil, that's gonna be very difficult to do. So here was a soil, we see four inch diff different horizons, zero to four, four to eight, eight to 12 inches in each row. Um, and then you've got a couple columns with bulk density and aeration prior to disking, and then the data uh, as to what they look like after disking. So what was the impact of disking here? Not very much. We did get some reduction in bulk density. It's still above that 1.4 threshold we would like to be below. Uh, but look at what happened eight inches and below. Nothing, right? Nothing at all. So this is a shallow treatment. Is this going to fix a plow pan? Yeah. No. If you look at old ag fields, sometimes they'll have this really compacted layer, you know, eight inches or so down. And that's because they've done this over and over and over again, year after year after year. They've tilled the soil on the top, but as they've been driving over it, it's been compacting the soil under it. So this is literally what caused a plow pan. So this is not going to fix a plow pan on an old ag field. So not your ideal treatment out there. This gets at something we've already talked about and why they used to disc all these upland sites. So on the left, that's a five-year-old stand after they've chopped it and planted it in pine. So is that a pine stand? No, that's where chopping just angered the hardwoods and not in a good way, okay? So they have all re-sprouted and that's your hardwood stand. Chopping is not effective for competition control. On the right, you had the stand that was discs, okay? So we can see it's, it's much more of a pine stand. So disking did give them better competition control because for the small hardwoods, it did damage those root systems and reduce sprouting on them, right? So they used to disc all the time for competition control, but here's some data. This is volume in cubic meters per hectare. We don't have to worry about that, more is better. But here's the stand tracked out to age 20. And that bottom yellowish line, that's the chop only stand. It has half the volume towards the end of the rotation as the other stands because of lots of hardwood competition. And then look up at the chop plus herbicide one. That's the orangish one, it's the second highest. So just by adding herbicide to chopping, you more than double growth. And I, I almost guarantee you, you could have done that without chopping and it would be pretty much the same, okay? So chopping is not giving you much increase in growth at all. It's just making a pretty site. So here's more data on don't chop unless you have that steep erodible site with lots of slash. And then we have shear pile disc and herbicide at the top. So very, very intensive. 
But you can see that only gave it a slight increase on just sheer pile and disc. So that disking is giving you some weight control. So again, herbicides are cheaper and more effective. If you do need to disc a stand for competition, for competition control reasons, use herbicide instead. But if you need to disc a stand because of soil compaction reasons, shallow compaction, go for it and you will get some side benefit of woody control probably. Um, here they're disking a very young pine stand you can see as a way to pre-commercially thin it. So if the trees are small, this equipment will run it over, so go for it. So some pros, it will help with shallow compaction, gives you some competition control, um, so it works okay. Because this is shallow, you may be able to do some disking in stands that have already, are already mid-rotation. That's gonna be pretty rare where you would see that done, but maybe. Um, the downside, you can cause erosion, you gotta get the slash out of the way, and then out in a forested cutover site, those discs are gonna be bumping up and down all the time as you hit stuff. So you're gonna have a hard time getting a real consistent job at a consistent depth. Now with both bedding and disking, we've been talking about this idea where you just go do it in a row, then you plant that row of trees. That's sort of a timber mine frame where it's operationally efficient. Um, but if you move to an urban forestry context or wildlife or restoration ecology, something where aesthetics is important, we may not want our trees on a grid. So there's variants of all these different treatments that you could apply in those situations. They're less efficient, they're more expensive, but if it's within your financial constraints and meets your objective, they're out there. So here's a shovel or an excavator and it's got an auger on it. So you could go out and you could auger areas, except instead of creating a hole, you're just augering and leaving that dirt in the hole. But now it's you know, nice and loose. You can plant a tree right there and it'll grow. So think about an urban area, you know, we're talking, we're putting in a proposal to knock down Miller Science and build a building right by the forestry building to replace it. And so if they knock down Miller Science and want to put some trees out there in a park in the middle of campus, that area has been under a building. It's super compacted. Something like this would, you know, allow them to put some trees out in there, right? So that might be a scenario where you would use this. Same thing with bedding, you know, if you want to bed, but you don't want your trees in a row, just go send an excavator out there uh, you know, dig up a big clump of soil and drop it next to the hole, then you've got a raised mound you can plant your tree on. So, same idea. Okay, so uh, this third soil tillage treatment here um, is going to be ripping or subsoiling. So there you see a pretty big ripping shank right there by that yard stick. So we know it's about three feet long. So, you know, you're moving a large implement through the soil at depth that needs a pretty big dozer, okay? So this is gonna be an expensive treatment. There's a few scenarios around here where you see this very commonly done. So the photo on the right you see there would be uh, like much of the land that's being managed for timber by Weyerhaeuser and other companies up in Oklahoma and Arkansas, where it's more mountainous terrain, lots of rocky soils. And so their typical prescription up there will be to rip it. And once they've ripped it, they'll hand plant right in those rips. And so what their foresters have, you can see them driving around in their trucks up there, they all have these just steel bars with a T-handle on top. Because after you rip, how easy is it gonna to be to go find those a few months later? It may be hard to see where they are, but you can take that T-bar out there, nope, 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 yep, it sinks right in. And so you can find them just based on the compaction in the soil. Now your hand planting crew, they all have dibble bars. They can find them pretty easily too, right? So even if you can't see them, they can find them. And then if they've done a nice job along the contour in a relatively straight line, it's easy to follow along out there. It's gonna help them with infiltration too, but really it's just lowering bulk density, breaking up some hard rocky soils. That's gonna be a tough region. That's probably <coughs> slightly outside the native range of Loblolly Pine, so very droughty, tough soils to work with. Um, on the left, you see a pasture being converted and that might be an example where you had row crop agriculture out there for a while. Um, and so you may have a plow pen, you can break it up with this, or it may just be a pasture. It may have never been in row crop agriculture. Um, pastures can get compacted too with the livestock. But if it's out in some of our eco regions like the Blackland Prairie or the Post Oak Savannah, we have a lot of those shrink swell soils that I talked about last class. And so there you may have real compaction issues where you want to rip. You may not want to plan in the rip on that scenario because what you'll see is as you get rainfall on there and the soils swell up, it can spit your seedlings right back out. So you may want to plant right beside the rip so they can root into that area of lowered bulk density 
but as the soil swell when they get wet, you're not just spitting your seedling right back out. Um, so there's a few scenarios where you may want to do ripping. When you rip, you're trying to break up compaction. So you are not trying to bring a bunch of soil out of that rip. So you want to look at the rip line and not see a bunch of big clods of dirt that they've pulled up. <laughs> Uh, so that would be ideal. I've seen examples where they've ripped where they're trying to plant cottonwood and they've just opened up this real wide gap. They've pulled a bunch of soil out and you can't really plant in that because now it's just a small trough of water in it. So you're just going to drown your tree if you try to plant it in there. So um, one good thing you want to do if you're ripping is try to hold that ripping shank at depth. And so you see uh, an example of a piece of equipment at the bottom that can help with that. One, it's got a coulter wheel that'll help cut in for that ripping bar. So that helps it get to depth and stay at depth. And then it, it's not just a straight or curved bar at the bottom. It's got that implement at the bottom where it may have wings sticking out the side. And those wings will hold it at depth and they'll help get you better soil fracture. So you get a larger area the trees can root into. You've got different applications of this equipment, eco-till that may combine it with other treatments. Lots of different options there nowadays. Um, if we look back at, you know, Oklahoma, Arkansas region, sometimes they'll have really big dozers and they'll actually put two ripping shanks behind them, space 10 feet apart. And so when they do that, they can go and rip up two rows at once. And so they've got one uh, option where they can plant their trees. They'll do what they call a 10 skip 20. So they'll run the dozer through. It'll rip up two rows 10 feet apart. Then they skip over 20 feet and do it again. So you have trees planted one row, 10 feet, another row, 20 feet is your next row. So if you think about what they've done there, they've basically planted a stand that's been pre third row thin. So when they come out for their first thin, they can go down the 20 foot wide areas and they can just go in low thin as their first thin. They never have to row thin the stand. You can put your trees on a tight enough spacing within a row, you still hit your target. You still hit your whatever 450 trees an acre that they're targeting there. Um, and now that dozer doesn't have to make as many passes, which means you save on diesel. So it's cheaper. So with ripping, with all these treatments, your, your planting spacing is tied into how you're going to have to do these. So that's why, again, we talked about more rectangular spacing. That 5 by 20 foot spacing gives you the same number of trees as a 10 by 10 foot, but you don't have to do half as many passes with this equipment. So it ends up being cheaper. So lots of different things you want to think about there. Um, the final thing I want to talk about when you do this, your intent is to reduce compaction, OK? So if it's just rained a lot and your soils are very saturated and wet, think about pulling a spoon through a bowl of oatmeal. Five seconds later, you can't tell where it was, right? So you're not gonna get good fracture on really wet soils and you may get your big dozer stuck. You may rut up the site, neither of which you wanna do. So you can't do this when it's too wet. And then, you know, think about our example of a black land prairie soil with a lot of shrink swell clays. What's gonna happen if you try to rip that in the middle of summer when it hasn't rained for two months? Good luck getting the bar in the ground, right? <laughs> the soil is just going to be too dry and too hard uh, to do this. So you see, you kind of need that Goldilocks zone in the middle where it's wet enough that it's feasible to do, but it's dry enough that you'll get fracture and you'll actually break up the structure on that soil. Okay, so here's data from that same study again. So there's the same data before they subsoiled and then to the right, it's the data after they subsoiled. Did subsoiling work? Did subsoiling work better than disking shallow? Yeah. Yes, it did. Lower bulk density, more aeration. And look at what it did at depth. It worked at a much greater depth, okay? So subsoiling works. We've seen all the nuances of it, but does it work? Here's data from height of four-year-old pine trees. Each pair of bars is the control in blue, and then the reddish orange is they've subsoiled. Did you get a big growth response from subsoiling? A little bit on some sites, and this is age four. So if there's a little bit of difference, that could be a bigger difference at the end of the rotation. But look at the example on the far left, no difference, okay? So you just did a really expensive treatment and you're not seeing better growth, but you look at that soil data, you should get more growth, right? It sure looks like it, but we got to think about how trees work. So say you go out and you want to auger a soil hole, you're doing this in class, so you're in soils class, you go out into a forest, you go and you dig your hole right by the biggest tree you can find? No, you go out in between all the trees, right? You try to find an area out as far away as you can get from the trees right in the middle of all, right? 
that's not where the trees are rooted. You're sampling the bulk soil, but the trees don't root in bulk soil. Trees root smartly. And so their roots are gonna grow in areas with low compaction, in areas where it's easy to root, okay? So if you've already had one rotation of trees out on a stand, they're gonna root into those old rotting stumps and those old rotting coarse root channels. That photo on the top right, that's a dead root from the previous rotation with a live white root from this rotation rooting through it. That photo on the left that's half covered up, or sorry, yeah, the photo on the bottom, what you're seeing is roots going down into an old rotting stump hole. You're seeing that in both those photos. And so trees will root into the old root systems that are rotting because it's easy to do. And that's where there's a lot of organic matter. So a lot of nutrients and a lot of water availability. So they're not rooting in the bulk soil. If you have a clay soil that has good soil structure where you pull it out and it's got those subangular blocky peds that are easy to pull apart and there's slight gaps between them, the trees are gonna root in between those peds. So you're not seeing a huge growth response to subsoiling if you've already had one rotation of trees out on the site because those trees have fixed any compaction problems that you have. So no need to subsoil at that point. So old fields, you may need to shrink small clays, you know, rockier areas, more mountainous terrain. That's where we think about subsoiling. So subsoiling works if you have a compaction problem you need to fix. If you haven't had a rotation of trees out there, you know, if you have those steep rocky soils where you really got to do everything right to get good survival in a challenging region, it works. Um, it may not work if you don't have the problem it's trying to fix and it's expensive and you have to get the slash out of the way. So, okay, then we have a combination plow. So you may hear this called a three in one plow, a Piedmont plow, a Savannah plow. Some of those are brand names, but basically you disc embed the soil. So those discs throw up a bed, but they're doing it last. They're at the far back of the equipment. So before they run over the spot, you've ripped and subsoiled it and this coulter wheel helps with that ripping and subsoiling. So you've fractured the soil and then you've thrown a bed up on top of that, okay? And then on top of that, you've got the shear blade on front. This was that stand that had a ton of slash. This was the dozer that was doing that operation. They, this dozer, huge dozer, wasn't powerful enough to move all that slash and have that implement down. So this was a two pass operation where one pass the implement was up, and they moved all the slash out of the way. Then they went back in with a second pass, put the implement down and put in the bed with the tillage beneath it. That's a 250 buck an acre job. So that's expensive site preparation. Okay, in the last few minutes of class, I just wanna talk about fixing problems. So this is ameliorating degraded sites and it just means we've screwed something up in our harvest operation, let's fix it. And the two options are compaction and rutting. Those are the two most common problems we see and everything we just talked about with disking and subsoiling, that went right to compaction. So we've seen how we can fix compaction. Uh, with rutting, it causes other problems where it's hard to get a good planting job. And you, know, you may have some areas that are compacted. Um, you may have trees that are having difficulty growing straight up and you know, just all sorts of problems with the ruts and as the ruts settle and then they may fill with water. And here's a few graphs, but they basically just show that the deeper your ruts, the lower your site is. You can cut your productivity in half, planting a rutted site versus a site that wasn't rutted, okay? And that productivity reduction can be worse depending on the soil texture. Sandier soils, you know, you may have less of a decrease because those ruts fix themselves, but clayier soils, those ruts may stick around for a while. And then the more of the area you've damaged, the more you've reduced site index, the more volume you lose. So again, you can cut productivity in half. But with either rutting or compaction, it's a good story. So these are harvested areas and skid trails on a couple different soil textures. This is looking at bulk density, so getting more to compaction. Pre-harvest, post-harvest, post-fixing the problems with site prep. So can we fix compaction with site prep? Yes, okay. Those bulk densities are the same or ever so slightly lower as pre-harvest. Um, we can look at different ways we can prevent logging damage to a site. So a good practice is to have a wet weather shutdown clause in your contract with a logger. So if it rains too much, they're not allowed to log. So they won't run up your site in the first place. That clause is gonna take enforcement. You as the forester are gonna have to go out there and say, you know, sorry, I know you wanna work, but we just can't do it out here today. So not a good situation. They're trying to make a living, but 
Um, it could save you a whole bunch of money and prevent a lot of damage to your site, at least temporarily. Um, you could fix it with tillage if you need, but then another thing you can do is use good soil mapping. So we did the FRC prescription at Field Station this past summer, past Field Stations, we've done a similar exercise and you've got that packet of maps they print out. So you go to work for a big company, you pull up that stand on the GIS system, you hit print and you get a map that says, oh, this soil is sensitive to rutting, this soil can be compacted, and you know you gotta be more careful out there. If you become a consulting forester, you have access to web soil survey, or if you're just a forest landowner, Web Soil Survey has data on rutting risk and compaction risk and other things in there that you can go look at. So map your soils, know the sensitive soils. Maybe you set up your contract where if rutting's an issue, you know, you've put out an 18 month contract, but they're only allowed to log on it, you know, the six driest months of each of those years or something, so. Find a logger that has low ground pressure equipment. The same weight skitter with twice the width tire is half the pounds per square inch. Is that a good skitter to use for a first thin? Maybe not. <laughs> Find a shovel logging system. So tracked equipment with a boom excavator arm with a feller head on the end of it, they can sit in one place and harvest a lot of trees from that one spot. They don't have to drive up to each tree. They can fell pulp wood, put it down and drive on top of it. They're doing it so their equipment doesn't sink, but that's also protecting the soil for you. And then if you cause a problem, we can fix it. The downside is it's gonna cost you money to fix it. So there's all of it tied together for you on one slide. So there's the take home message and there's a table in the useful handouts packet that has pretty much the same information that'll help you with mechanical site prep in your prescriptions. So any questions on mechanical site prep? Okay, that's it.